Well, this was a very interesting week. There was a huge info dump regarding Flight 5 and the issues that are leading it to be delayed to no earlier than the end of November. Plus, Ship 31 gets ready to resume engine testing at the Massey Outpost, and crews are hard at work cleaning up after Hurricane Francine thrashed Starbase. Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. It was admittedly a bit of a slow week this week, with the beach getting closed and there being tons of flooding in the Rio Grande Valley area thanks to what would later become Hurricane Francine. Francine formed in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast, and its outer bands dumped a ton of water on Starbase. As you can see here, Highway 4 going into Starbase was underwater and the wetlands became small lakes due to the sheer amount of rainfall. This, along with high winds and lightning, halted all work at the launch site for safety reasons until the storm passed. This really goes to show just how vulnerable Boca Chica and Starbase are to both hurricanes and sea level rise, and really underscores the idea that anybody that lives in any area that's prone to being hit by a hurricane needs to have a solid hurricane plan. I mean, this was just a tropical storm and it barely passed by Starbase. Imagine if we got hit by a three or a four. I honestly don't want to think about it. Just if you're in any Gulf Coast area where you might get hit by a hurricane, please take the warning seriously. Have plenty of water, plenty of food, extra batteries, transistor radio, you know, a backup battery so you can charge your devices, maybe a little solar panel for the backup. You get the idea. Just stay safe out there, everybody. Now let's move over to the Massey Outpost where SpaceX has continued to test what we're calling Test Tank 16. As a reminder, TT-16 is a Block 2 ship aft section with just another dome welded on top to help enclose it and provide an interface for the can crusher cap to push on the structure. This test stand allows SpaceX to test loads on the structure in many directions and they can even use it to apply uneven loads. You can see here, crews even have an actuator installed to the aft flap mount to apply loads. This all culminates in being able to certify the Block 2 ship aft for flight loads, since changes have been made since Block 1. The other item to be tested over at the Massey Outpost is, of course, Ship 31. Ship 31 has yet to conduct a static fire test, although it did seem to have an aborted test on Saturday the 14th. That's the day I'm recording this. And here's where it gets interesting. There are a pair of transport road closures for Massey's to production site on September 17th, which is the primary, and on September 18th, which is the backup. These both run from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. These closures could be for Ship 31 to roll back to the production site after completing a static fire at the Massey Outpost, or they could be used to move Test Tank 16. As usual, we'll just have to wait and see. Although, these closures have been wrong in the past, so this could very well be a closure that ends up being used to move Booster 14 from the production site to the Massey Outpost in order to complete cryo-proof testing. Booster 14 should be good and ready for a cryo proof, given that it was fully stacked way back on April 26th of 2024. It would be really cool for SpaceX to roll Booster 14 out for cryo proof testing. That way, once it gets back to the production site and back into Mega Bay 1, there will be three boosters inside with full sets of engines, and that's pretty nifty. Now let's move over to the production site where work on the new Star Factory entrance continued all week until crews finished installing the glass and new door late in the week. Maybe we'll get lucky and see some interesting things rolling around behind the new glass and doors. The Star Factory to office building connection continues to be worked on and will look pretty interesting when completed. From this shot, it looks like the glass will follow similar lines to the other corner and go up to meet the office building glass. As we can see here, Mega Bay 2 is getting a new set of vents near the top of the internal bay, but underneath the top floor. These could be exhaust vents for when air systems are running and the door is closed so that SpaceX can at least have some climate control. Peering into the Star Factory, we can see what we suspect is Ship 34's nose cone. As you can see, it's all tiled up and is outfitted with flaps. It could emerge any day for stacking with its payload section to start off Ship 34 since Ship 33 is off of the turntable. It's going to be really cool when SpaceX starts picking up the pace on building Block 2 ships and even eventually Block 2 boosters. Next up, an interesting piece of hardware arrived in Starbase this week, which is the potential HLS mock-up from Hawthorne. This was immediately rolled inside the Star Factory, so it's possible that we could see a fully built HLS nose cone sooner 
rather than later. Moving on now to pad B, we've been watching for several weeks as crews have been installing sheet piles to create a rectangular area in which to dig and keep the water out as they construct the flame trench. Well, this week, the equipment that's used to install those piles left Starbase, which could possibly indicate that the installation of those pilings is complete. With this done, crews will eventually start digging all the way down to the concrete floor that has been formed using jet grouting. In this process, high-velocity jets of liquid are injected into the soil and mixed, which can be used to create a seal at the bottom of a planned excavation, which could have happened here. We're still a few months away from seeing the pad rise out of the ground, but it's good to see that crews appear to be making good progress. The tower crews have started connecting the commodity lines from the tower sections to the base of the tower, as seen here. Sooner or later, we could be seeing piping laid into the trenches that will eventually lead to the fluids bunker and tie into the orbital tank farm. Moving over to pad A, crews are slowly but surely installing all of the reinforcements we've been talking about non-stop for the past few weeks. Lots of progress is being made here, and with the significant delay until flight 5, which we'll cover here in just a moment, they have a lot of time to figure everything out and make sure they get it right. With all this extra time on their hands, SpaceX has started to paint the booster quick disconnect hood, indicating that work on it should be completed. And they're painting the orbital launch mount deck as well. These are pretty good signs that SpaceX is getting very ready to launch, just not quite catch yet. Okay, now for the big news, and you better strap in because there's a lot of information here. According to the FAA and SpaceX, Flight 5 is being delayed to no earlier than the end of November due to some environmental issues that have popped up. This saga over the last week has a ton of angles, so we're gonna go through them step by step and also talk about what SpaceX might be able to do in the interim. First off, on Tuesday of this past week, SpaceX posted an update titled, Starships Are Meant to Fly and it starts off talking about SpaceX as a company, as well as why they're making Starship in the first place. And I know, we've all heard the phrase, making life multiplanetary more times than we can count. The update then goes on to talk about just how much progress SpaceX has made since starting the Starship program, and how they'll need to rapidly iterate in order to fulfill their contract with NASA and the Artemis program to get back to the moon, and eventually Mars. SpaceX mentions that it takes longer to do the paperwork than build the hardware, which kinda doesn't make any sense as it takes at least a year to get a ship or booster ready, and this is just a delay of about 60 days or so. We'll get to that 60 days number in just a second because there's a lot to unpack here. Now, as SpaceX posted several weeks ago, the Flight 5 vehicles are ready to fly, and that appears correct given that almost no work has been done to Ship 30 while sitting at the Sanchez lot, and Booster 12 remains parked in Mega Bay 1, complete with its hot stage ring. Then we get to the bad news, where SpaceX mentions the late November estimate for the launch license provided to them by the FAA, and they state that this is not related to a safety issue, but is in fact environmentally related. However, SpaceX failed to mention that they themselves submitted new information to the FAA in mid-August, which widened the environmental impact area. This is kind of like turning in your homework late and wondering why you didn't get a full grade or why the grade was late. Now this was in a statement from the FAA provided to NSF after an inquiry, and that statement reads, quote, SpaceX's current license authorizing the Starship Flight 4 launch also allows for multiple flights of the same vehicle configuration and mission profile. SpaceX chose to modify both for its proposed Starship Flight 5 launch, which triggered a more in-depth review. In addition, SpaceX submitted new information in mid-August, detailing how the environmental impact of Flight 5 will cover a larger area than previously reviewed. This requires the FAA to consult with other agencies. SpaceX must meet all safety, environmental, and other licensing requirements prior to FAA launch authorization. A final launch determination for Starship Flight 5 is not expected before late November 2024." End quote. Now, there's even more to unpack here. The FAA is essentially saying to SpaceX, look, you have a launch license that you can use to fly right now. You just have to use the same launch profile and vehicle configuration as Starship Flight 4. This should apply to Booster 12 and Ship 30. Instead, SpaceX opted to try for a catch. Of course, 
Last week, we just got done talking about why SpaceX made this decision to try for a catch now rather than later, but that decision was easier to justify when we thought SpaceX would be flying sometime in late September or early October and not late November or maybe even December. And I hate to say it, I hate to be that guy, but at this point, maybe even 2025. In addition to the problems with the launch license, there are also issues to fix with the launch pad itself. SpaceX presumably still has more testing to be done with Booster 14.1 once all of the reinforcements that are currently being installed on the chopsticks and tower are completed. So why doesn't SpaceX just fly Ship 30 and Booster 12 using the same profile as Flight 4? Well, you'll have to ask them. But SpaceX did ask the FAA for a multi-launch license, and they got one. They just don't appear to want to use it now, which, if I'm honest, is a little bit frustrating. I know we all want to see starships fly, and SpaceX could fly right now and just try for a catch later once all of the issues with the pad and the chopsticks are worked out. Later on in the update, SpaceX mentions that before Flight 4, they looked at how the hot stage ring would fall to Earth and where it would land and if it could have any impact on marine animal life. It worked in concert with the FAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service to determine those impacts. According to SpaceX, it was found that the impact was near zero. However, that data seems to have changed after Starship Flight 4, once SpaceX got to see how the hot stage ring behaved in the real world. After submitting this data in mid-August, which, according to SpaceX, is a marginal change in splashdown location, the FAA approved a 60-day consultation with the National Marine Fisheries Service to determine if there were any new significant impacts. I guess at least the question I have about all of this is, how much bigger is the hazard area, or how much different is the hot stage ring location that this sort of review was necessitated. All right, now we get to get into the really fun side of the environmental issues at play here, and those are the fines that SpaceX has had to pay with regards to its DELU system that was built after Flight 1. First off, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ, had fined SpaceX for not having the correct permit to operate their DELU system. This was originally slated to be a $5,000 fine out of a maximum of $25,000, but it was knocked down to $3,750 due to the fact that SpaceX had recently applied for an individual TPDES, or Texas Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, industrial wastewater permit on July 1st, 2024. Yeah, that's a mouthful. This deluge has been operating since July 15th, 2023, when it was first used after being built because... Of course, Flight 1 dug a massive hole in the ground. In their update, SpaceX said that this deluge fell under the Texas Multi-Sector General Permit. I'm no environmental expert, but apparently this was not the appropriate permit for it to be classed under. Now to be fair, SpaceX does say they have a permit number assigned, which became active in July of 2023, which is of course when the deluge system was first activated. However, SpaceX hasn't supplied that permit number, nor any sources that the TCEQ signed off on the deluge. It's only their word, so it's a bit of an open question of who told who, what, and when. As we read on, SpaceX talks about how the deluge system uses literal drinking water, and those are their words, not ours. And while they may put drinking water into the tanks, there is no way that the water coming out is drinkable afterwards unless SpaceX went through all the trouble of certifying the system as a potable water system. Would you want to drink the water that's coming out of the deluge plate, especially after it's hit with Raptor engine exhaust? I mean, I, I probably would, but something I would do is not exactly a measure of a good idea. Anyway, along with the fine from the TCEQ, the EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, also fined SpaceX for violations of the Clean Water Act for not having the correct permit, which we just talked about. This fine is a little bit bigger, but nothing that would actually hurt SpaceX. It's $143,378. This is covering eight discharges, seven of which are from the water deluge system, and one of which was the discharge of 36,000 gallons of liquid oxygen into the wetlands. The water discharges are all from static fires, launches, or just tests of the deluge system, in which about 180,000 gallons of water were used. An estimated 75,000 gallons of water were not captured or vaporized by rocket exhaust and on average about 37,000 gallons of water went into the wetlands. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, that this is nothing compared to the amount of rainfall the area can get, but that rainfall does not go through an industrial process before being discharged into the wetlands. The liquid oxygen discharge, however, was shortly after Booster 7's Spin Prime mishap, or Spin Boom, or 
whatever you want to call it. Either way, RIP white hose. After this mishap, SpaceX used the dump valves at the bottom of the booster to drain the locks from the vehicle. SpaceX ended up settling with the TCEQ and have a proposed administrative penalty with the EPA with a public comment period that closes on October 21st, 2024. And still, questions remain. Did SpaceX really not know that their deluge was not covered under the general permit? Did the TCEQ really not tell them? Did the EPA not say anything? Based on the fines, it does seem like the TCEQ never signed off on the deluge. Either way, there's so many open questions, and without SpaceX providing any source documents in their update, it makes it kind of hard to know exactly what's going on. Hopefully, we'll get some more information at some point to determine what actually happened, but for now, we can only use the information that we have at hand. Okay, so after going through that super fun walkthrough, let's go back to the launch license and Flight 5 as a whole. SpaceX should be able to launch Ship 30 and Booster 12. Heck, they should even be able to launch Ship 31 and Booster 13. I mean, they have a multi-vehicle launch license for Block 1 vehicles, do they not? So why not use it? At this point, it does sort of seem like SpaceX is their own worst enemy here. And it should be mentioned that SpaceX did in fact choose this particular licensing option, as it would be easier for them to iterate launch by launch. However, the Part 450 license is not designed for constant iteration like what's being done with Starship. It was instead designed as an all-encompassing license to cover launches and re-entry. Again, there are so many layers to the story here, and so many moving parts, it's hard to know exactly who's right and who's wrong. As always, we all want to see starships fly, and we all can't wait for Flight 5 to happen, so hopefully things get sorted out sooner rather than later. I know this was a lot of talk about bureaucratic stuff, but it's important that we go over what's happening with Starship behind the scenes on the regulatory side. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned, we're going to go live when Ship 31 eventually does static fire, whenever that happens. Thank you for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other. Also, Dan's here. Also, Dan's helping us clean up after Hurricane Francine thrashed Starbase. It's a mess. All right, go away.